Welcome to the Agrihood. Carnes Crossroads is a new home community with a farm-to-table lifestyle. Just outside of Charleston, here community is defined by gathering together and our deep connection to nature. Learn more at CarnesCrossroads.com. Today's show is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's tryexpressvpn.com slash space for three months free with a one-year package. Visit tryexpressvpn.com slash space to learn more. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9... Ignition sequence start. Space nuts. Five, four, three, two. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Da 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 da. That was a fanfare, by the way. To celebrate episode 150 of the Space Nuts podcast. Hello, I'm Andrew Dunkley, your host, and with me as always is Professor Fred Watson. Hi, Fred. Hi, Andrew. I can't believe we've got to 150. <laughs> I, I think we lost count somewhere. We went. We started it like that. It's like that thing the kids used to play tricks on me. That, look, Dad, I can count to 100. One, two, miss a few, 99, 100. <laughs> <laughs> that's where I think. That's where I think we went. This is really well, only episode four. Yeah, well, <laughs> it feels like episode 1,026. It, does, <laughs> it? <laughs> it feels like we've been doing this forever. Well, it's probably. Uh, but, well, it's probably yeah. Over three years now, I guess, or it'd be getting on three yes. years. And well, you, that's right. You add all our radio programs to it, and it's getting on. It is in the thousands. Twenty-three it, years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And if you were to add all the other radio shows you've done over the years, Fred, I dare say you've probably had more airtime than me. <laughs> it's not impossible. <laughs> mm. Now we dedicated this show to uh, answering questions, and we got a whole raft of new questions since our last episode when we put out the appeal and some people have come up with some awesome thoughts, uh, things that they've really wanted to know. And we're going to cover everything from water in the universe to planet nine to hawking radiation to the afterlife. Uh, It's all been asked about and uh, we will do our best to answer your questions today on our 150th edition of Space Nuts. So let's start, Fred. And we'll go with a question from Paul Batty. Hi, Paul. Thanks for your question. Uh, He says, hi, uh, Andrew and Professor Fred. Really love the show. I listen on Radio Australia. I didn't even know we were on Radio Australia. There you have it. Uh, Anyway, question. How rare are liquids in our universe? They're quite common on Earth, but I suspect that uh, this state of matter may be rare. There's two parts to his question. Uh, Second part uh, is, uh, if I may, given uh, wherever there is liquid water, you will find life. I'll put a pin in that for the moment. Perhaps wherever there is liquid water anywhere else in the galaxy, we could find life. Though I suspect going back to the first question that liquids sustained over billions of years is very rare. Is this correct? Thanks again for the show. Where do we start on this one? We have talked about liquid water in the past, and uh, I suspect he's spot on in terms of uh, liquid water in the universe. It does appear to be a rare thing. Uh, yes and no, Andrew. Um, Good answer. And, uh, well, let's let's get um, to the to the point. Uh, in terms of water generally, and by that I mean the molecule H two O, no matter what form it's in, um, that is the most common two element molecule in the whole universe. So the the raw material of liquid water is everywhere, but a lot of it is in a vapor form in what are called molecular clouds. Uh, It's, you know, it's basically part of a nebula, uh, a a gaseous nebula. Um, So it's only when you get it on planets uh, that there's a possibility of it becoming liquid. And the normal situation, and this, certainly this is the situation on Earth, if you have a planet which is within the Goldilocks zone of its parent star, so it's at the temperature that liquid water can exist, but also has an atmosphere which effectively stabilizes the body of liquid. So if you have a, 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 a you know, you put a planet in the Goldilocks zone, cover it with water, if you've got no atmosphere, it simply evaporates and becomes water vapor, gaseous water in in space. Um, So you need this blanket of, in our case, air, 
to, to, to maintain the liquidity. And that situation could be fairly rare. We don't know, but um, it could be a rarity. However, liquid water can occur in other ways. And we know of s several examples in the solar system. It's about half a dozen, including the planet Mars, where <clears throat> there is liquid water underneath a layer of ice. So instead of an atmosphere keeping it liquid and in equilibrium, the ice is protecting it from the vacuum of space and the liquid water is sustained underneath the ice. So you've only to think of Europa, uh, Ganymede, uh, Enceladus, Titan, all these moons uh, of Jupiter and Saturn, plus, as I said, Mars, because um, last year there was a discovery made of a large reservoir of water underneath that's the right. southern polar yes. ice cap. Yes, that's so, right. I remember. So... It, it, it's rare, but but uh, perhaps where there are planets, it's not so rare, and that's really why you know we're so keen on um, on evaluating all these exoplanets, planets around other stars that are being discovered. Second question, uh, if I may, he says, given wherever there's liquid water, you'll find life. Perhaps on Earth, on Earth he I think he means yes, which would be right. In on Earth, that's right. Uh, but that, of course, is why we're so excited about these places where we know liquid water exists. For example, Enceladus. Uh, Saturn's moon Enceladus has uh, an, an ocean underneath the icy surface, which we know from Cassini's results has uh, um, th you know, th uh, hydrothermal vents at the bottom of it. So there's heat processes taking place there. That's the kind of environment in which life kicked off on Earth. Maybe, just maybe, life has kicked off in the oceans of Enceladus also. But at the moment, we've got no way of finding out. Enceladus actually offers the best possibility of finding life in such an environment, though, because it's squirting out this water in these jets from its southern polar region. Uh, cracks in the ice let the water leak out. It's got fountains of tiny ice crystals, which have already been sampled by Cassini. But there are at least three missions being planned to have a, a closer look at these with a view not just to looking at the the kind of chemical makeup of it, but the biochemical makeup, these perhaps prebiotic chemicals, lipids and proteins and things of that sort. So uh, it's a great question, and yes, we're on to it. <laughs> there you go, Paul. So, uh, yes, there is liquid water in our solar system, uh, and there's certainly and, – and that sort of opens the door to the possibility that this is not an uncommon thing in other systems outside of our own. So um, – and, and it, it is, is there life in that water? That remains to be seen. Of course, the other uh, side to this coin, Fred, is that it's also possible that life has adapted to liquids other than water, like methane. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, and that, of course, you're thinking of Titan, mm. uh, Saturn's largest moon, Titan, which has does have liquids on its surface, this liquid ethane and methane. Um, and it is just possible that there may be life forms that have developed in that using ethane and methane as their working fluid. Um, another really interesting question. We need to send a spacecraft there as well to find out. Yeah, I think we're running out of spacecraft. But, <laughs> yeah, we, we, there's so many places to explore. And the, the, the wonderful thing is we've got the technology now. We can do this. It's not cheap and it's not fast, but uh, it can be done and has been done more often now than ever before, really. So thank you, Paul, for your question. Hopefully you got the right answer. And uh, we will move on to a, um, a question from uh, Jake Bain. He's responding to a post we put on our Facebook page the other day about that house-sized asteroid that um, basically passed Earth uh, the other day. Uh, I think it passed sort of um, half the distance to the moon, if I recall correctly what the story was about. Anyway, Jake says, so curious, what would have happened if it hit a city or would it have been another fireball uh, like the one that was over Russia, Chelyablinsky's talking about? Uh, size of a house, what sort of damage would that do? Yeah, that's on the... It, it is on the, um, the, the the scale where there would be damage on the surface. So the, the Chelyabinsk uh, meteorite, or super bolide, to give it its proper name, back in 2013, was about that size, about uh, 15, 20 metres. <clears throat> that hit the atmosphere at 30 kilometres per second, got down to a height of 30 kilometres above the surface before it exploded. And, of course, it was the shockwave from that explosion that did the damage. It uh, smashed windows and knocked down walls and things of that sort. 
Um, so you've basically got exactly an example of, of what uh, Jake's question is. The Chelyabinsk incident was pretty well what would have happened if this house size object had, had hit the Earth's atmosphere, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, uh, a month or so ago, whenever it was. There is there's one um, caveat with that, though, and that is that uh, asteroids or small asteroids, large meteors, whatever you want to call them, they vary a lot in composition. Some of them are made of almost solid iron. And an iron meteorite uh, of that size coming through the atmosphere would not, uh, almost certainly would not explode in the atmosphere and disintegrate. You get a big chunk landing on the ground. So there would be an impact site with possibly a crater. And if that, <clears throat> if that impact site was the middle of a city, uh, it almost certainly would have done catastrophic damage. It would have you know, been a major civil defence uh, problem. So the one that missed us, well, it misses as good as a mile. The good news about these things, as I always say, <clears throat> excuse me, Andrew, I'm losing my voice here. Uh, the, the good thing about them <clears throat> is that these things have been whizzing by the earth for billions of years, and it's only now that we know about it because we've got the wherewithal to measure them. So there's really, um, <clears throat> the situation has not changed much over time, but we we now know much more about the Earth's environment than we did. And so we recognize the risks. It means that um, we are also working on schemes to try and deflect one of these if it turned out that um, over a, you know, a long period of time, we could see that it was going to collide with the Earth. At the moment, there's nothing on the horizon for a collision for at least the next 100 years. So that we know we're doing of. A, <clears throat> that we know of, yeah. <laughs> It's always That's why great, I said there's nothing on the horizon. There's, there's always the great unknown. <laughs> there but is, yeah. It always yeah. takes me back to that great science fiction novel by Isaac Asimov called Nemesis, which was about a uh, an impending collision with Earth, uh, um, an end of days kind of an event, and they overcame the problem <laughs> by sending an orbiting spacecraft uh, to deflect it slowly, uh, veer it off course over a number of years. Which, Which I, is, yeah, yeah, would work, I guess. That's what would happen. That's mm, right. Mm. It's, it's all about how much notice you've got. If you've got, if you've got ten hours, then you're talking about civil defence measures. Yeah. But if you've got ten years, then you can you can do something about it. That's right. Mm. Okay, uh, Jake. Thanks for the thoughts and thanks for visiting our Facebook page. Uh, now let's uh, move on to uh, a question about Planet Nine from Simon Adam in Melbourne. He says, uh, and thank you, Simon. Uh, if we are so good at using Newtonian mechanics to predict when a solar eclipse will occur in 200 years from now and when Jupiter will rise and set to the second and the like, why can we not use this method to find Planet Nine? I appreciate Planet Nine is a long way away and very dark, hence it's not straightforward. But if you assess Neptune to move over here and Uranus to move over there, why can you not plug these abnormalities, along with uh, other known orbital anomalies, into a smart algorithm which shows that a body of this size must be over this location? I'm sure the technique is being used, but why isn't it uh, a sure thing? Great question. And um, so Simon's absolutely right. This technique is being used. That's exactly why we think there is a Planet Nine out there. Um, and of course, this, uh, what Simon said is, is exactly how the planet Neptune was discovered. Simon said, because that's was, a good one, Fred, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was because of anomalies in the orbit of Uranus that uh, didn't make sense. Uh, that was uh, the prediction <clears throat> that led to the discovery of Neptune. In fact, the mathematics were so good, uh, and this is back in 1846, that uh, when, when they finally got around to looking for Neptune, where the mathematicians said it should be, they found it within an hour. Uh, it's, uh, you know, an hour of observing. So the method works. The reason why, in this case, it isn't a sure thing is that we're dealing with vastly greater distances than what we have in, you know, what you might call the inner solar system out to the orbit of Neptune, because these objects are tens of times further away. Um, and the, the 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 only things that we've got out there uh, whose orbits might be modified by the presence of a planet nine 
are these uh, extreme, um, what, what are called extreme trans trans-Neptunian objects. They're things in the in the Kuiper belt, way way out there beyond, beyond the orbit of Neptune, and they're tiny. They're little asteroids, uh, not planet-sized things, uh, which you know move in response to another planet. These asteroids do move in response to a planet, but each one of them represents a very small quantity of mass. So what you've got to do is lump them together and look at the way they behave as a group, and it's that that has led to the conclusion that there is a planet nine, because their orbits all align. These, um, it's a selection of, I can't remember how many it is, it's about half a dozen or a dozen or something of them that have very peculiar orbits in terms of their, their, their alignment and the inclination, the tilt of the orbit, and it's those factors that get fed into exactly the kind of algorithms that Simon's talking about, uh, that reveal that there is something out there modifying this part of the solar system. But it's not big enough and not close enough to have an imprint on the orbits of Uranus and Neptune and, for that matter, Jupiter and Saturn, the, the, the planets of the outer solar system. So it, you're on the money, Simon, with what you're suggesting, but it's just the sheer distances involved that make this such a difficult project. OK. Uh, we will find it one day, I'm sure. I think we will too. Yeah, I think so. Remember where you heard it first. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> um, thank you, Simon. Great question. We love uh, we love talking about Planet Nine, uh, only because uh, we all know it's there and we're just waiting for someone to spot it. Uh, but, you know, when, when we talk about distances, Fred, we, we sort of um, limit our thinking to um, the likes of Neptune and Pluto and... Um, uh, and the other Kuiper Belt objects, but we're talking about distances far beyond that, which That's right, comes yeah. incomprehensible to to a certain degree. Yeah, mm. yeah, but much greater distances. I'm, I'm, I don't have the, the numbers to hand. I was writing about them quite recently, but um, I don't have them to hand. But you're talking many tens of times further away than Neptune is. Yeah, that's just... Hard to contemplate. But uh, anyway, thank you again, Simon, for your question. And Simon says we need to take a break. Uh, you are listening <laughs> to episode 150 of Space Nuts with me, Andrew Dunkley, and Fred Watson. Now, let's take a little break and find out more about our sponsor, Express VPN, rated number one by Tech Radar. Uh, this is the one I use. I've been using it for a couple of years and I love it. When I joined Express VPN, they were, they were brand new, uh, new to the market, but uh, I read a lot of reviews and did a lot of comparisons. And there was just something about their, their business model that I particularly liked. And a couple of years down the track, honestly, can't complain. Their interface is very easy to use. Their, their service is second to none. Uh, I've had to contact them a couple of times about um, certain things that I wanted to do, and they were brilliant. So you may be wondering why I do need a VPN at all. It's all about privacy. Uh, do you really want big tech companies, governments, and others knowing uh, what's going on with your online activity? Even if you're having nothing to hide, it just feels downright creepy. Uh, I think you'll agree. And governments are getting more and more interested in what you're doing every day. And so, yeah, protecting your privacy is what VPN is all about. And how often do you uh, run across websites that you want to get information from only to find that they're geo-blocked? This is becoming an increasing problem, but ExpressVPN solves that problem for you. Uh, now, if you go to our special URL, you'll see quite a list of things this service can help you with, things you may never have thought of before. As I say, it's the one I use, secure, fast, and it just works. Uh, so protect yourself online today and find out more about how to get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's T-R-Y-E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash space for three months free with a one year package. Try expressvpn.com slash space to learn more and you'll find the link details in the show notes and on our website. Now... Back to the show. Three, two, one. Space nuts. Now, Fred, we are going to look at a question from uh, Judas Falling. I just love your name, Judas. Judas Falling. It sounds like uh, the name of a great science fiction novel <laughs> or a movie. It's just horrific. Anyway, um, 
he says he's a long time first time. So he's been listening for a while. First time he's contacted us to um, to ask a question. Anyway, he says, I'm always confused when we talk about the universe being flat. Does this mean the expanding universe is not like a spherical bubble, but more like a plane, like the galactic plane or the way our solar system has a roughly flat plane? That is a great question. Absolutely is. And and. I think it um, is an indictment on we um, astrophysicists because we use this term and if you talk about a flat universe, then naturally people are going to imagine something like the solar system or the galaxy, which is flat. It's it's basically concentrated in a plane. But that's not what we're referring to when we talk about the universe being flat. Um, we're referring to the underlying geometry of the universe. <laughs> And this is where it gets a bit of a headache. Um, so the way to think of this is instead of well, let me let me just let me step back. Um, Judas's question starts: Does this mean the expanding universe is not like a spherical bubble? Uh, no, it doesn't. So the expanding universe, as far as we know, is like a spherical bubble. So keep that picture firmly in your mind. Um, it's expanding. As far as we can tell, it's expanding the same in all directions, which means, yeah, it's basically got spherical structure. So, it, so it's a bubble. It is not a flat disk or something like that. It is actually a bubble. Now think of it um, squashed to two dimensions. I know this is, I've just said it's a bubble. So what I want you to do now is imagine you've taken away one of the dimensions. So what you do have is a flat surface. Um, that represents the universe pretty well because uh, the geometry of a flat surface is the same, you know, it's what we what, what we regard as standard. For example, Pythagoras' theorem works and the angles of a triangle all add up to 180 degrees. That's true on a flat surface. But if instead of that, our universe compressed into two dimensions was curved like a sphere, for example, then you would have a different geometry. You wouldn't have a you know, a right angle triangle making Pythagoras' theorem work. You wouldn't have uh, triangle angles adding up to 180 degrees. They'd be something quite different. So that that is one sense in which a universe could be curved. There is another sense as well, which is quite interesting. The universe could be saddle shaped. And what we mean by that is um, if it's curved one way in one direction and the other way in the other direction. You might think of a saddle. You know, it goes on the back of the horse, so it's curved around the side of the horse, but the front and back of it are curved upwards, so you don't fall backwards and forwards. That's exactly the kind of geometry. It's, a, it's in mathematics called a saddle. It's, and, it's also the shape of a putting green that golfers hate the most. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, because you don't know where the ball's going to go. <laughs> so that so that's another possible geometry of the universe. If you know, if you imagine your universe collapsed into two dimensions, but it forms a saddle, then it's got a curvature. It's got this curved geometry. And the bottom line is that all our measurements, our experiments, and everything points to the fact that the universe is actually flat, and that means its geometry. You know, is is like a flat a flat plane, the geometry of a flat plane. So that's what we mean by it. It's a very it's a very poor uh, descriptor because it, it immediately conjures up what exactly what Judas has said a compressed you know a disc like universe. That's not what it means. Okay, so it's a sphere spreading out in all directions at the same time, but it's flat. Yeah, <laughs> its geometry is flat. I'm confused. <laughs> I'm always confused. But um, this, this is the one prop. This is the one place where Space Nuts lets us down because we can't put diagrams in. No, well, we, <laughs> we should get it. should get somebody to put one on the Facebook page or something like that, showing a saddle and a, and a you know and a curved space. Yeah. Anyway, Judas, you asked the question, <laughs> and that was the answer. Um, but but the, the main thing to remember is the universe is like a spherical bubble, not like. A, a, you know, a, a tabletop. It's not a disc. It's not a yeah, a flat plane. Kind even of though it's flat. Yeah, even though. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs>
Moving on. Thanks, Judas. Moving on. Moving on. This, uh, <laughs> this is a question from uh, an astrophysicist observer named Andrew Mortimer. Hi, Andrew. Thank you for your question. Uh, he says, hi, Andrew and Fred. Thank you for your show. It's a great time to be talking about all things astrophysics with all the great new observations. A quick question. Can we observe hawking radiation in the recent black hole image? Personally, I hope so. Can we? Um, I think the answer, the short answer is no. Uh, and that's mm. because Hawking radiation is incredibly weak um, and has never actually been observed. We know it exists as a theoretical entity. It's accepted as reality. Uh, it means that over very, very long periods of time, uh, black holes evaporate. But um, it's so low. I think you could probably say it's so low as to be unobservable. I might be wrong with that, but I do not believe any kind of Hawking radiation has ever been observed. What has been observed are uh, analogues. You know, you can set up an, an, an analogue of um, a black hole with radiation. In fact, you can do it with sound waves. It sounds bizarre, but you can do that. And I think Hawking radiation reveals itself under those circumstances. But uh, in direct observations from a black hole, no, it's not been done yet. Even with that supermassive, what is it, 6.6 .6 billion solar mass black hole at the centre of M87, even there we can't see it. Mm. it. It sort of brings up the the point that there are a lot of things we know about that we have not seen. Uh, and up until the other day, we had never seen a black hole. We haven't seen yeah. Hawking radiation. We haven't seen dark matter or dark energy. But we know they all exist. It's, yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's one of the strange anomalies of uh, astrophysics, I suppose, and probably one of the key frustrations of the, of the, <laughs> um, of the role, I would imagine. Yeah, it is, it is a bit annoying. That's right, when people think you're just making it up as you go along. <laughs> <laughs> no, never. No. Although sometimes that's how discoveries are made. You've got to come up with a theory. And yeah, you, you do. work around the theory until you prove it wrong or right. It's yeah, exactly. That's science, isn't it? It is the way science works. That's mm. true. Okay, Andrew, thank you so much for your question. Hope uh, we covered it. It was brief, but sometimes the answers are that simple. Uh, no, can't. <laughs> Mm. You're listening to the 150th episode of the Space Nuts podcast. Okay, we checked all four systems and team with a go. Space Nuts. Finally, Fred, let's tackle a couple of questions, shall we? Oh, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> This That's is, a great idea. That's a good idea. Uh, this <laughs> yeah. is episode 150 of the Space Nuts podcast where we asked you to um, basically send in some questions that have been sort of teasing with your brain a bit of late. And the uh, next question comes from Richard Adams, and it sort of uh, harks back to uh, Judas Falling's question about the shape of the universe. He's asking about the shape of black holes. Uh, firstly, I've been listening for quite a while now and thoroughly enjoy your podcast. My question is about black holes, or more precisely, the direction and shape of black holes. It just seems strange to me that something of that magnitude is simply a one-dimensional well um, drain hole in space. Uh, they exist in a multi-dimensional fabric, so shouldn't they also be multi-dimensional? For example, a very large black uh, billiard ball shape uh, rather than the rim of a black frisbee disc. I guess this might quash the theory that they may lead somewhere, but, hey, I'm just saying the uh, disc shape doesn't make sense to me. All the best. Good question. Uh, what is the shape of a black hole? Now, we've, now that we've taken a photo of one, are they able yeah. to glean the shape? Yeah. Well, yes. So let, let's just clarify a couple of things here. The black hole itself is not one-dimensional. It is zero-dimensional. It has zero dimensions. It's just a point in space. Uh, even though the space around it is multidimensional, of course, the black hole is has no um, length. Basically, it's a zero dimension. And that's why the f physics of them are just so hard to try and understand. In fact, most of our known physics breaks down in a situation like that because you get things like an infinite density, which is how you define a black hole. It's a point in space where density is infinite. But there is a shape to it. Um, and in fact, there are two things here that um, 
you can uh, attribute shape to. The first is the event horizon, and that's the most important feature of the black hole, and that's what we saw in the image, the shadow of an, an event horizon. So that's the, the point of no return. It's the point beyond which even light cannot penetrate. Uh, so uh, if you were looking at a black hole, uh, sort of you know, a naked black hole, you might call it, that what you would see would be the event horizon. And the diameter of that event horizon sphere is dependent on the mass of the black hole. So for a, a black hole of the mass of the Earth, the, the event horizon is 18 millimetres in diameter. It's the size of a golf ball pretty well. That's the size of the event horizon. No, for a, a really? one, Yeah, it's tiny. For a one solar mass black hole, a black hole the mass of the sun, its event horizon is six kilometres in diameter, but it's still pretty small. Uh, yeah, they're, they're weird things. Now, what I was going to say, though, is that, and I'm talking back to distant memories here, but I think I'm correct in saying all this, um, the, the physical parameters of the black hole include things like its electrical charge, whether it's rotating, uh, something we call angular momentum, and they can change the shape of the event horizon. Uh, I've got vague memories of looking at diagrams in, in physics books showing uh, pumpkin-shaped black holes because they're rotating. Um, I might have the, the exact details wrong and I should check them up, but that's, 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 that's the bottom line is the event horizon is not always a, a perfect sphere. It can not, be... Not a, not a jet punk, pumpkin as we call them in Australia. Otherwise, uh, it's a squash. A squash, yeah, yeah, that's right. No, it's not, not that shape. Um, it's it's just like yeah, it's. I'm not quite sure what a good analog analogy will be. But... <laughs> a, tradition, a traditional Halloween pump, pumpkin. That's exactly right. A there traditional Halloween pumpkin. Thank you very much for that helping me out. We didn't have pumpkins where I grew up, Andrew. I'd never seen one until I came to Australia. Really? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. very interesting. Yeah, I used to read books about Halloween and think, what on earth are they talking about? Anyway, never mind. That's a different story. <laughs> so um, you can get different shaped event horizons. But the bit that's like a disc, and maybe this is what um, uh, what Richard's thinking of with the Frisbee shape, that's the accretion disc. This is the swirling disc of material that is uh, circulating at very high velocity around the black hole event horizon before it crosses over that and disappears into the black hole never to return mm. so it's um there is a disc to it but it's the it's the you know the stuff we can understand actually this is the 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 um gas and probably bits of stellar debris uh, being sucked into the black hole that swirl around like the water going down the plug hole that kind of feel to it but um at very high energies even though you know their temperatures are in billions of degrees that stuff that's whizzing around the black hole uh but we can understand the physics of that it's that the point itself that physics breaks down where you've got this zero dimensional singularity very bizarre so it is not necessarily a sphere but it ain't flat uh that's right the black hole itself is not flat yeah. okay there you go richard hopefully that leads to a better understanding of black holes. I mean, the astronomers and astrophysicists are still trying to understand black holes, but uh, we're getting more and more information, and uh, this photograph is being analysed very, very thoroughly, and um, very soon we hope to have another photo of a mm. black hole and uh, be interesting to compare the two and see what the differences are. And maybe one will be shaped like a pumpkin and maybe one will be shaped like a potato. Actually, I'm thinking, Fred, I wish I grew up where you were from because I hated pumpkin as a kid <laughs> i'm used to serve it every other night and um they used to make, force me to eat it uh now now i love the stuff it's just yeah. a, it's a matter of training your mind that's what indeed it's that's right and your palate and your palate yeah that too okay thanks richard we'll move on to our final question in this the 150th episode of space nuts this one comes from ralph we saved this to last ralph ralph haney in california because it's sort of takes us into a new realm. Uh, Dr. Fred Watson, a hypothetical question, if I may. Personal beliefs and experience as a side for just a moment, I beg you to consider one question to rule them all. If you were to learn when you die that there is in fact a higher being, a creator of our universe and existence, and you were granted one solitary question as a scientist and astronomer, what would that question be? 
not the meaning of life, that's 42, would it perhaps be regarding dark energy or pre-Big Bang or ex extraterrestrial life or something far deeper and mysterious than even space nuts have discussed? Dr. Watson, what would you ask? We need to know. <laughs> what a great question. I love it. I love it. Yeah, it is. It's a great question. And all the things uh, that Ralph mentions you know, like extraterrestrial life, dark energy, and what was like, what things were like before the Big Bang. They're all, they are all questions that I'd love to ask, uh, as any astronomer would do. But the one I think that would come to mind um, is, okay, why? What's it for? Mm -hmm. Why on earth have we got it? Um, and what leads me to that is thinking that you and I, Andrew, have explored in the past on Space Nuts, the possibility that we we may be the only um, species in the entire universe with the mental capacity to try and understand the universe and to, to perceive it and to study it and to know it's there. If we're the only species like that uh, and we manage somehow to wipe ourselves out or an asteroid gets us in the end or whatever it is, what on earth is it all for? Why is the universe there? It just doesn't make any sense at all. And I think that's a point where our reason breaks down. It was um, uh, um, Pauli, the great physicist Pauli, who postulated, he, he made the comment that, you know, maybe at the most fundamental level, we cannot understand what's happening in the universe, because we are part of the problem. We're in it. We're part of it ourselves. And so maybe we are conditioned to think in a way that really doesn't allow us to perceive the great truths. And uh, he was thinking about things like the nature of time and, uh, you know, the nature of the, the Big Bang and things of that sort. But I think it goes to the, heart, to the, the wider question of why is the universe there? We're part of it. And so uh, it, it's not really an issue that, that can be addressed. Um, so, <laughs> and being on the inside, as you said, may be the most limiting factor of our analysis of the universe. If you were able to step outside it and look upon it, yeah, maybe you'd go, "Oh, you, you'd wow! Get it. Oh, oh, that's what it's right. Like. That makes sense. Yeah. Those black holes all do this, or yeah, something yeah. <laughs> to that effect." Exactly, <laughs> but we're not. We're inside it, and uh, that's a bit of a problem. But, but it's, to be honest, Andrew, being inside it is better than the alternative. Yes, yeah, because so. that suggests a rather drastic change. <laughs> so, so your question would be to God: Why is it so? Why is it so? <laughs> why is it there? You know, why is, what's the universe for? Yeah, is it is it just a bit of entertainment on the part of the creator? Who knows? Mm. My question, if I may indulge myself, uh, is yes, sure. how is there existence? Yeah. Because I, I, I got a friend and often we, when we're playing very bad golf, we, we talk about these, um, the, these sorts of topics and uh, we, we talk about if you sit down quietly by yourself in the dark and just contemplate the fact that we exist, it is miraculous in itself. And, yeah. you know, how is it so? How do we exist? Where did it all come from? And, you know, that leads to the why and, and yes, so it does. more questions. You've got things like the nature of consciousness and all this sort of thing that comes. Mm. Yeah, comes and, and the so, question yeah. of a soul and the question of a, yeah. a, a, a as um, as Ralph suggested, a um, um, a deity that, that sort of is all being and all knowing and, and a creator. But, okay, if that's the case... How did they come into being? Why do they exist? Well, we yes. The, question, the, know, questions are on, that, the questions are ongoing. Ongoing, yeah. <laughs> mm. But it's a great question, Ralph, and we do appreciate it. And uh, hopefully uh, Fred's answer to your ultimate question was adequate. That's what we strive for here. I've said it before. <laughs> <laughs> Excellence, forget it. We just do our <laughs> just to, to be adequate. Yes. Uh, thank you to everybody who sent in questions. I think we got all the questions answered that came in post episode 149, except for one where they asked us to um, um, list our top five favorite science fiction novels. But as a science fiction not fan, um, that would have been not easy for you, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> 
but I could have, um, I could have uh, yeah, I'm sure I could have. Of course, I was, gonna, I was going to say Parallax, but she she preempted me and said, "Yes, I've read it. I really enjoyed it, and I can't wait for your next one." So, oh, there you go. That's, <laughs> good. that's, well, that's all you need to know, Andrew. That's all you need to know. <laughs> and and the shameless plug I managed to get in again uh, for the book. Mm. 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 Any word on yours, Fred? Is it is the publisher got? Well, yes, it's name has changed again. <laughs> oh, what's it going to be called now? <laughs> Cosmic Chronicles. Oh, I like that. Yes, I do too. Yeah. Um, and so I've just got um, the um, the publisher's notes to the editor as to what's going to happen. They're, they're, they're taking out all my jokes, oh. uh, which I'm not surprised about because most of them were rubbish anyway. <laughs> but <laughs> it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It might have, though, and this is something that I'm rather chuffed about, Andrew. Um, when I was I mean, I'm going back 50 odd years now. When I was still at school, uh, I used to uh, have a rather artistic flair, and I did a lot of sketching and drawing, which earned praise from various people. And um, um, we're thinking of trying to get some diagrams in, which I'm going to draw not with a computer, but with a pencil. Oh, maybe uh, you should to... draw one of the spherical flat universe. That's right. Um, That's what for, to do. for Judas, and we can um, we can <laughs> get that on the, the cover of our next Facebook. Further. Post. Yeah, you never know. I might do that. Yeah. The flat universe. All right. So uh, we'll uh, see how it goes. Yes, indeed. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, another thing that people might not know about you, Fred, is um, you like to compose and play music. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's been, a, there's been a few over the years. Mm. Indeed, that's right. Yeah. yeah. We're going to have to get you to play the guitar on the podcast one day. Yeah, I should do that one day. Yeah. yeah. That'd be fun. I got mine over here. I got. Ah, just... good on you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we better call it quits on episode 150, but uh, we will be back with episode 151. Thanks to everyone who uh, contributed. I know we've got a little bit of a, a, a backhaul of questions that we will get to, um, so never fear if, if, if you missed out this week. Fred, it's been fun as always. Thank you for uh, 150 uh, <laughs> terrific episodes. <laughs> Thank you too, Andrew, for putting up with it. We'll speak again very soon. We will indeed. Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and from me, Andrew Dunkley, thank you so much. Look forward to catching you next time on Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes and Stitcher or your favourite podcast distributor. This has been another quality podcast production from Sites.com.